today we are going to have Jeremy Darrington talking about election data. Um, and I'm very excited about this. Jeremy has been working, uh, we worked with Jeremy quite a bit in the webinar series, and uh, he's very knowledgeable about political issues and political data and political research, and so I'm very excited to have him here. He is the politics librarian at Princeton University's Firestone Library. He received his MLIS from the University of Washington and has had degrees has degrees from BYU and UC Berkeley. He's the past chair of the Law and Political Science section, which is now the Politics, Policy, and International Relations section of ACRL, and is the past convener of ACRL's New American Ge Geospatial Data Services and Academics Libraries Interest Groups. Um, group. He is also the political science editor for resources for college libraries. In addition to all areas of politics, his research interests include technology and libraries, government information, digital privacy, dabbling in code and data science, and a wide range of social science topics. Um, so I'm very excited to have Jeremy present to us today. All right. Sounds good. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, like Linda said, my name is Jeremy Darrington, and um, I'm the politics librarian at Princeton, and I work a lot with election data, and it seemed rather apropos that this time of year, or the, just about a week before election day, that we should have a session about election data. To introduce this topic, you know, if you've ever dealt with questions about elections data in the past, um, or are fielding those now, um, you know, these tend to go in cycles. You see a real uptake in these anytime we have a presidential election cycle in the United States. But uh, for me, I see them often around midterm elections as well, though more so with the presidential elections. But one of the big challenges, of course, is in the United States, um, our federal system makes this uh, much more challenging than doing elections re uh, research in many other countries in the world for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one being that we don't have one national agency that's in charge of administering elections, gathering elections data, and reporting it out, um, as many other countries do. Obviously, this is an issue of sort of federal uh, jurisdiction and scope. And it's nicely illustrated in the next couple of slides here. So first, this is a slide that actually shows sort of the reporting about absentee ballot usage in the 2008 elections. It came from a Pew report from a couple of years ago, but what it does nicely is it illustrates really clearly for you how many different counties there are in the United States. There are more than 3,000 of them, and elections in the United States are governed primarily at the county level, right? So we're not dealing even with just 50 states, which would make things complicated enough. We're actually dealing with more than 3,000 election agencies in the United States that are in charge of both administering elections, um, counting ballots, reporting elections, and they all do it in different ways, right? They all have different systems. They all have different voting technology. They have different re rules and regulations about what is to be reported when and how. Um, so this makes our job a little bit difficult. And if that weren't really bad enough, we have the fact that in addition to 3,000 counties in the United States, there are more than 170,000 precincts where the actual voting takes place, um, and which are staffed by almost entirely of uh, across the United States by volunteers, people who uh, generously donate their time to spend all day uh, at an election poll, um, helping to make sure things run as smoothly as they can in this big, complicated country that we live in. So this is a map from the 2008 uh, presidential election showing the winners um, by party in, in and around Cincinnati. And so you can see each dot represents a different precinct uh, in and around the city. And this is kind of a nice map, I think, because it shows one of the truisms of uh, US electoral politics, presidential politics at least, certainly in the last several electoral cycles, which is you see a uh, growing divide between sort of urban and rural voters. Um, so you see the suburbs are all in red, um, voting Republican, and the uh, key urban areas of Cincinnati all in blue. You know, that's that's one of the big challenges with uh, researching elections is, is that election data is not always easy to find because it is so fragmented in terms of how it is collected, how it's uh, reported. And, you know, interestingly, um, it's not just even, that's not the only challenge. The other challenge has to do sometimes with, in terms of the jurisdictions or the geography in which people are interested in getting election data. Uh, this is rather complicated as well because the boundaries for elections can be complicated. And um, one of the ways that, a good way to illustrate that is that, um, for example, in, in congressional elections, you know, each constituency is a congressional district. Well, those don't always align with county boundaries. 
uh, in states in the United States. Um, it would sure be nice if they always did, but they don't. Uh, let alone other types of uh, geographic or pseudo-geographic boundaries that people sometimes want to get election data um, reported at. And so an example being like zip codes, sometimes you get people coming and asking for uh, you know, presidential elections sorted by zip code. Well, uh, it's just not reported in that way. And zip codes are actually sort of a strange artificial figment of our imagination anyway, because they don't really align with real physical boundaries. They're an artifact of the postal system, right? So um, that makes for uh, additional challenges as well. So today, um, there's a lot we could talk about elections, but we're going to talk specifically about electoral returns. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about voter turnout data. And then a couple of things, actually, about the administration of elections, which I think is, is interesting, a little bit lesser studied uh, in political science, but one of those areas that I think is of growing interest, especially you know, in this current electoral cycle, lots of claims about uh, rigged systems and rigged elections. Um, it's useful to have some knowledge about different types of, of means of uh, measuring how elections actually perform in the United States. And um, I have the link here to uh, a libguide that I put together on this topic. Um, it has all the links that are in this slide, plus many more on different aspects uh, that we won't have time to cover today. A brief overview of kind of electoral return data. Um, first, I think it's useful to think about when you're working with your patrons, what types of sources actually report electoral data that, uh, that you might be interested in. Specifically, I'm looking at electoral returns here, so the actual tabulation of votes. So this could come from a couple of sources. Um, first would be the official sources. So these are the actual boards or divisions of, le of elections at the county level. Often these will be aggregated and then reported back out at the state level if you're lucky. Um, and uh, so those are usually done through like a state um, secretary of state's office, or sometimes there's a state division of elections that will aggregate um, all the reports down from the county levels and report them all in one place. Um, there can be unofficial sources, right, that um, can provide lots of useful uh, data on elections. Um, so a good example are like news sites, like the New York Times has a great site always on uh, the presidential election and usually on the congressional elections as well. And um, those are best obviously for live coverage. So you know when things are happening um, in the current election, that's the place you're going to go to get uh, sort of up to date minute up to the minute um, information on the elections and the returns as they come in. And those are all pulled actually from the Associated Press, which has a very extensive uh, field operation down at the county level and all the counties across the United States where they have people you know, basically shadowing the county officials as they tabulate the data, the electoral returns, and then they're just sending them back in by phone or, um, or you know, by data entry to the AP offices, which then you know, have a live link out to the major news sites who have purchased that data from AP. Um, those are great. Uh, the news sites have some really amazing uh, data visualizations and interactive features. One of the uh, problems with them, of course, though, and many of you have probably experienced this, is that the news sites, um, number one, the data on the news sites is not easily converted into actual tabular data if people want to use it for analysis in a paper or some kind of research. Um, usually they're more about the visualizations and sort of making sense of the data, which is not surprising given that their primary audience are people just consuming news. The other problem is that uh, they don't tend to be preserved over the long haul. So even the New York Times, as venerable in, as an, an institution as the New York Times is, uh, typically won't keep up their, um, their interactive elections material for presidential elections more than a single cycle. Right? So right now on the New York Times website, you can go back and find most of the coverage from the 2012 presidential election is still there and fairly usable. But if you go back to the 2008, you can find some of the 2008, but half the data is no longer there. Um, the links are dead um, and completely unusable. And anything before 2008, just forget it. It's not there. So um, you're going to want to obviously need to look to other places um, beyond just the news sites. Now, a third source that often people don't think about is that um, the actual uh, reports of voters themselves constitute uh, important information about election returns, right, about vote, uh, voting in the election, who people voted for. 
And there, there are various voter surveys that do this. The primary one, uh, the primary two, really, series of surveys that cover this are the ANES, the American National Election Study, uh, which is a long-running study of uh, major elections, primarily presidential, but also um, congressional elections, going back to the 1940s. And this is the primary source in political science that's been used to study voter attitudes, um, you know, as well as get information on both prospective ideas about who voters think they're going to vote for in the election, as well as sort of retrospective um, analyses of who they say they actually voted for in the elections. The National, election, the National Exit Day Poll um, series of surveys, these have been done by the major networks and major news networks um, in conjunction with uh, sort of a consortium that they've put together to field these in recent years to kind of share the cost. And um, these, as they, as they sound, you know, these are Exit Day polls. So as people are coming out of the polling booth, they ask them, you know, a, a sample of these people questions about who they voted for, why they voted, what their experience was, other attitudes. And so those can be a rich source as well. Finally, um, I think another useful set of questions to ask yourself is before you jump into looking at any data sources is, um, you know, a series of questions to help you narrow this. And uh, these are probably obvious, but it, I think they're worth uh, repeating. First, you need to know, you know, what office are you looking for? Is this a state office? Is it a federal office? Um, your sources are going to be really different depending on the answer there. What years are your patrons interested in? Do they want one year? Do they want multiple years? Um, what jurisdictions and at which geographic level? And this is the one that I usually get the most frequently, which is, you know, people coming in and they say, you know, they want presidential election data for whatever, you know, 2000 uh, through 2012 or something. Um, but then you have to dig a little bit deeper and try to figure out, you know, well, what is it you're going to do with this data? How are you going to analyze it? Uh, and depending on what their answer is, you know, they may just want sort of more summary level kinds of data um, or trends, um, which you can get for, from a lot of different sources. But often they're going to want to go, if they're doing real sort of data analysis, they're going to want to go at a much narrower geographic level. So often at the county level, and some people want to go down even further uh, than that, down to the precinct level, um, if they can get it. And finally, another question to ask yourself is, you know, what format will be useful to your user, right? I mean, um, some of these sources that I'll show you are specifically uh, put out in, you know, a straight sort of data format for use in some kind of statistical software like Stata or R. Um, and for many users, um, depending on what it is they want to do, that's really going to be overkill um, or not terribly useful useful to them because they don't know how to use those programs or work with it. Um, and so, you know, you may want to look for something else that comes maybe just in a straight sort of spreadsheet format like Excel or a CSV file uh, that would work for them. You know, on the geographic level as well, I, I just want to add that it's the same question there of sort of overkill, right, in terms of specificity. Like, you know, people may want stuff at the county level. Um, and some users might get excited to be able to get things at the precinct level. but it's such a huge volume of data that for many people, um, that's going to be overkill as well. So jumping into the actual returns, um, we're going to go through presidential first here, and then we'll kind of go down the uh, ballot, as it were. So um, I'm not going to cover any state-level sources. There are lots of sources online that do a good job of, of presenting sort of tabular form, state-level summaries of, of vote returns. And I've listed a couple here. Um, you can probably find many more online. Um, so really, the, the heart of this starts happening down at the county level. And that's primarily what most people are interested in. Um, and that's the most prevalent form of kind of uh, narrow geographic reporting that you can get. You can get some stuff down to the precinct level, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, primarily, you're going to find things at the county level. That tends to be how it's gathered. And, and mostly, until recently, that's almost always how it's been reported. One of the first sources that, that's really uh, worth looking at, and many of you at working at academic libraries will have access to this, the CQ, the Congressional Quarterly, uh, CQ Press, has put together a lot of great uh, collections on American politics. And they have a collection called the Voting and Elections Collection. And it's quite good. Um, it, you know, this is a subscription source, and it's, it's fairly pricey. So some of you may not have access to it or may not want to have access to it. But to show you what this looks like, and I'll just say, this is my uh, elections guide. Um, and so there's my handsome mug right there, if you're really interested in what I look like. But oh, 
and that just logged me out. So <clears throat> to show you the CQ voting and elections collection here, um, it, there's a lot of information in this collection. It's not just electoral data. Um, in fact, most of this collection is a lot of very rich contextual information about elections. Um, and there's a, a lot that we could talk about that we're not going to because we're really focused on the data sources today. So if you're interested in the data in this uh, database, you have to kind of click up here. I always find this a little bit counterintuitive, but you click up here on download data. And it'll give you the option of selecting which office you want. We'll talk about some of these others in a minute. Um, which electoral cycle. And then <clears throat> Uh, you can choose either to get a national number, but most of the times you're going to want this kind of county level detail. Um, these come out in this sort of nicely formatted spreadsheets. The one challenge with uh, CQ voting and elections collection is that they limit you to downloading only 10 states at a time. It's a little bit of a hassle. Um, I guess it, they just want people stealing all the data and then posting it online or something. But um, anyway, you can deal with it. Uh, if you have to, but it's a good source um, and it's usually the best source for kind of the most recent uh, elections um, in nicely formatted kind of county level returns. The next source that's a, a really good one that many people um, know more popularly is, is Dave Leap um, has put together this wonderful U.S. elections atlas. Um, he makes actually a lot of his stuff, especially the state level summary data as I mentioned up above here. Um, available free online for anybody to use. Um, he's got a lot of great maps as well. Um, but you can actually get a site subscription uh, as an academic institution to his site. It's actually uh, really affordable and will give you access to county level data for um, presidential elections going back to 1912. And in some cases, he's got some states done all the way back to 1884. So this is a great source. Um, it's not quite uh, immediately as useful as the CQ voting and elections collections in the sense that the information you get out of here from counties, and I'll show you this in just a second, you have to go sort of uh, state by state. Um, and, you know, you get it in this tabular form. But you can cut and paste this into a, you know, into a spreadsheet, and it formats really nicely. It's a little bit more tedious to get the information out here if you're going to get a lot of states all at once, if you want to take all the whole country. Um, so it's a little bit more tedious than CQ voting in elections, but it's a lot cheaper, too. So if you're, uh, if you can't, if your library can't afford something like the CQ Voting and Elections Collections, um, you should look into Dave Leap's Atlas. Um, it's a great site. Plus, he has a lot of other information that he sells, um, a couple of sources that he sells as spreadsheets already sort of pre-formatted. Uh, and some of those things are not actually fully included here in the online sort of web version. Now, the one note I'll make on this, and um, <laughs> Dave's kind of funny about this, but he's been doing this for a long time. And, you know, interestingly, the, the sort of visual representation of elections data with Democrats in blue and Republicans in red is a relatively recent artifact. So Dave's been doing this for uh, a number of years, and he and a couple other places I know of, when they first started putting up electoral data in maps online, they actually had this reverse, right? So the Democrats were represented in red and Republicans in blue. And uh, some of them, like Dave, have stuck to their guns and said, look, you know, we're not gonna go, I'm not going to go back and reformat everything in my whole entire database um, to change to match what everybody else has sort of coalesced around a, the opposite scheme. So just note that when you're looking at it, that's a little bit backwards from what you're used to. The, another level, uh, not level, but another project that um, is interesting is this open elections. And most of you probably haven't heard of this one, but this was a project started about two years ago, I want to say, two or three years ago, with a Night News Challenge grant. And uh, it was a great project. I've been following with a lot of interest over the last couple of years. One of the lead developers is, is Derek Willis, who used to work for the New York Times as a data journalist, and now he works with ProPublica. Um, and it's all entirely volunteer-driven. Uh, you know, they had a big grant from Knight to get stuff started, but most of the work is now happening by volunteer. And so they rely on volunteers to gather and then to process the data. Um, and so this is sort of an ongoing project. And I'll just sort of put a plug in for this, that if you have any interest, I really recommend going and, and signing up with Open Elections and seeing what you can do to help out uh, this project, because it's great. It's entirely free and open. And um, they are now posting data on their site. It's, uh, a lot of it's still sort of in process, um, but they have raw files for many of the different uh, types of things that they collect. And so you can go sort of state by state and see what they have. Um, generally, these are running from 2000 to the present. 
um, but they get stuff down at the county level, but a lot of this is it can be actually at the precinct level, um, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but uh, a great source and um, has a lot of, of great things to offer. So if you have any time to spare, you're sort of a elections junkie, go help them out. Another uh, good source for presidential election returns um, are a series of data collections in ICPSR. So you have to obviously be an institution that is an ICPSR member. Um, but this is uh, a more sort of heavy data format. So if you want somebody who really wants to get a lot of elections all at once, already formatted um, it directly for use in like Stata or R, this is the source to go to. And I want to just uh, mention on this one, one thing that I've figured out uh, working with this over time is that, number one, uh, it's, a, it's a big collection of files. Um, so this is just the 1950 to 1990 portion. You can see they're doing files every couple of years, every two-year cycle or so. Um, some of them are, are fairly large files. Most of them there are not too unwieldy since there are uh, multiple years in here. But it's a lot of files. You have to take them all out at once. Uh, but you get all the states all at once. So that's sort of the nice trade-off there. And they come out in multiple formats. You can see Stata, R, Excel, whatever. Um, but the one caution that I'll say on that is that <clears throat> When you first download, it takes a little bit of reshaping for most users to be able to use this in any kind of a helpful format. So when you first download uh, one of these collections, so this is the 1984 presidential election, you can see over here on the left, um, you know, we have the state code, have the county names, the districts, the kind of stuff you'd expect. But then you get into here, this is the reported vote by party. Now, this is based on a longstanding coding system that ICPSR uses for elections data, which is one of the first things that ever went into ICPSR. And it's based on a heavily extensive collection of political parties that have contested elections in the United States, um, of which there are many hundreds. And so you can see these are all codes for individual political parties that contested the 1984 general elections. So it's quite extensive. Uh, and if you're interested in just Republicans and Democrats and maybe like, you know, the Reform Party in 2000, 2000 or, you know, the Libertarian Party or something, uh, this is going to be a bit overwhelming for most of your users to use. Um, so it takes a little bit of, of work, but you can reshape it. And you have to go refer back to the code books um, for the most recent years in the collection. So like 1984, 1988, 1990, I think. Um, actually, the earlier code books don't tell you what all the codes stand for, which is a little bit of a challenge. So if you look in those later code books, you can find out which uh, variables represent which parties. And so, I, you know, I created here sort of a reshaped version of this that had, I dropped all the parties I didn't want. I just wanted to look at sort of the major parties and code it in here. And that's a lot more easy to work with. So if somebody wants to come in and get, you know, the electoral turns, you know, they can get them rather easily. So that takes a little bit of work. Beyond the county level, occasionally I get requests, and, and you may too, for presidential elections reported by congressional district. Now, this is a bit of a challenge because, um, Relatively few states actually compile results by congressional district, um, and they tend to be only those states where the congressional districts actually line up really well with the county boundaries in a state. Um, it's not true in many cases. There are at least 15% of all counties in the United States include portions of more than one congressional district. Right, so it's, it's a little bit challenging, and most of the states then don't opt to try and figure that out for you. <laughs> so. Um, there's only really one good source that I know of that reports this really consistently across the entire United States. And um, it's a, a man by the name of Clark Benson uh, who works at a company he founded called Polydata. And he's been doing this for a number of years. Um, and he has data uh, going back to about 1992. And, and these are things that are only available for purchase. But they're fairly cheap. They're like 100 bucks a spreadsheet um, or per electoral cycle. Um, and he does great work. It's a very time-intensive, labor-intensive work. Um, so I really encourage you, if you get these kinds of questions, to, to go to his site and, and buy the spreadsheets from him, help support his work. Um, but that's the only real source that gets us. Dave Leap has some uh, presidential elections data at congressional uh, district level. But like I said, they're select states, and they go back to about 2000. Now, for presidential elections on the primary side, um, you can get these out of some of these main collections. So CQ Voting and Elections Collection has it for um, all states, but the years really vary quite widely depending on 
a number of factors, and mostly that has to do with when states actually started introducing primaries, which um, really is a relatively recent phenomenon, mostly since the 1970s, um, and it's really variable. So, you know, primary data is messy. Uh, it's not super comparable because um, in most years until the last maybe 15 to 20 years, you don't have most states even contesting primaries. Um, it's only in, in recent years that a majority of states do it, and obviously not all states even field primaries. Many of them still run on a caucus system, so you don't get uh, representatives for a statewide um, returns in the same way you would with a primary. Um, and one of the interesting things as well, if you start looking into this, is that many states have really bounced back and forth between uh, primary forms, between you know primaries and caucuses, between different types of primaries. Some states have held primaries, and then you know the next electoral cycle they don't do a primary at all, and then they pick it back up again a, a couple of years later. Um, so it's really messy data, and, and that's reflected in, in the different sources that try to report it. So CQ is a good source for that, um, for presidential primaries. Dave Leap has, um, has a good collection of this uh, as well, down to the county level. Um, and the primary data in CQ is down to the, to the, to the county level as well. Um, Days actually can also be purchased separately as, as spreadsheets, which is sort of handy to have it all in one spot. And, and they're not too pricey. If you, know, if you have some room in your budget left over, it, it's a worthwhile purchase, I think. Um, but actually, there's, uh, this is one of the times when I'm going to mention some print sources. There's uh, kind of two key print volumes done by Rhodes Cook, who did a lot of uh, work with CQ Press on collection uh, election statistics over time. And um, so these cover sort of 1968 all the way up through 2004. And it's very well documented. Um, and I've actually, over the summer, I started working on a project to convert these into a data collection. Um, and it's kind of slow going. I'm about halfway through, maybe. So maybe in, in when if I do this uh, sort of recap of this again in, in four years, <laughs> I can tell you that we've got it going. Now, moving into the congressional elections, um, again, CQ has uh, good coverage of House and Senate general elections. Um, for House, obviously, going back a long time, back to the 18, early 1800s. Um, the Senate, obviously, um, Senate general elections didn't start until around 19, uh, 12, 1914. Um, so they don't go any earlier than that. Uh, they were always done sort of um, by the state, appointed by the state, usually through the state legislature before that. Um, and as far as Senate elections, they're down to the county level um, starting uh, in the late 60s. Um, this collection here, this is a, a set of spreadsheets that Dave has made available um, from his elections atlas uh, at the county and congressional district level. And again, this is one of those ones where the boundary uh, misalignment is, is kind of in, uh, Interesting, right? So usually House elections are reported the constituency, which is a congressional district. Um, but sometimes um, I have patrons come who are interested in getting uh, House elections data reported by county. Right? So again, it's a little bit of a messy thing. Um, and uh, But Dave has, has done some reporting and, and gotten these from, from different states and has them back to the early 90s um, for the House elections. Both, uh, So the spreadsheets have it both at the state, county, and congressional district level. Um, and I should say, with the with those spreadsheets from Dave Leap, those are not actually in the uh, web platform at all. These are only available in the spreadsheets because um, it's kind of a lot more data, and it's hard, a lot harder to represent visually, and so he hasn't chosen to do that. Um, again, the, the ICPSR data series have uh, a very comprehensive collection of congressional elections data. It says, you know, this collection data goes back to 1788. That's primarily for presidential. The uh, congressional stuff goes back to the early 1800s um, and a little bit before. Uh, some of it's a little bit spotty. You know, obviously, the further you go back into the early uh, part of the republic, some of that data is a little bit spotty. There's some missing data, but um, that's a great source as well but again, in that sort of more heavily statistical data format. And uh, you know, another one that uh, many people haven't heard of um, is this constituency level elections archive. This is actually primarily a collection for cross-national elections research. Um, and it is 
one that uh, is primarily used for foreign elections, but you know, the United States is included in there, and it's all based on this same ICPSR uh, series of data sets. One of the nice things, and the reason I mention it here, is that they have a really great subsetting feature in their website, so you could actually go in and just pull out the couple of years you want um, instead of having to go in and download sort of electoral cycle by electoral cycle from ICPSR. You go and select you know, a certain number of years, and it'll get you a whole um, spreadsheet all at once. Or you could choose selected years. So um, that's kind of a nice feature. And again, Dave Leap um, has Senate general elections um, in his platform uh, by county back to 1990. Congressional elections um, at the primary level, um, these uh, are only reported really uh, by congressional districts, so um, very few places, in fact nobody that I know of actually reports it uh, at the county level for primaries. Um, so CQ has some of this um, going back a, a ways, um, primarily for the Senate's uh, elections for House primaries, they didn't start those till the mid-90s. Um, but the, the second link here is from a scholar named Stephen Pettigrew who's done a nice uh, collection uh, from the America Votes series. So many of you are familiar with that print series. Well, he went through and compiled them all from 1956 to 2010 and put them into a nice uh, data set, which is in Dataverse. Um, and so that's freely available. Um, and he's also included a number of other variables at the district level as well, including some stuff about candidates and their background and, and gender for some of the more recent years when he could collect it. Um, Open Elections Project has uh, primary elections um, for both the House and the Senate. And again, that's sort of in process, but uh, worth a look for the more recent years, especially if you uh, don't have access to like the CQ uh, voting elections collection. Um, and then, um, the, you know, there's some one-off things in ICPSR, like this one from the South, uh, covering a select series of states, 11 states down in the south that has both primary and election, general election data, but uh, mostly it's uh, an emphasis on sort of the primary elections. Um, gubernatorial elections, um, these ones, the one thing to note about gubernatorial elections is um, they happen all different years, right? So um, as opposed to congressional elections or presidential elections, which happen in this nice regular two and four year cycles, um, gubernatorial elections happen at all sorts of weird times. Um, and so, you know, in every, any given year, you may have a whole bunch of gubernatorial elections. You may have three. Um, so that's one thing to know when you go in searching for this. You need to know sort of what the cycle is for the elections um, in that particular state so you know which years to look in. Um, so some of the uh, key sources here cover gubernatorial elections as well, so I won't really go through those. Um, now, at the precinct level, so this is the really, really uh, disaggregated election data, so down to the individual voting precinct where you actually went to you know, the local school or whatever to cast your vote. You can look at these things down at that uh, very granular level. Um, it's a huge amount of data. These are giant um, election files. Um, but there are some good sources, primarily for more recent years, to be able to get this um, precinct level election data. So. Uh, the most recent one is the Harvard Election Data Archive, which covers sort of 2000, mostly 2002 and primarily 2004, up to 2012. Um, this is a big project done um, by some scholars out at Stanford and a few other places. And uh, it's freely available in the Dataverse. Um, also includes some gubernatorial elections and, and a few statewide offices um, in some cases as well. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is they tried really hard to align the precinct boundaries to the voting tabulation district boundaries as reported in the U.S. Census so that you could compare things to uh, sociodemographic data that's in the, the U.S. Census. Um, that's not an easy task. Um, those, align, those boundaries don't always align, um, and many times they had to sort of you know, basically make a guess. They had to do sort of imputation of certain districts where they couldn't find the actual shape files, or in some cases they didn't exist, um, which is one of those scary things about having more than 3,000 uh, election agencies administer elections in this country is uh, surprisingly frequently uh, they lose data from previous elections. Um, so all the more reason, I guess, to collect it now. Um, for the 2000 election, um, out of, I want to say this is out of George Washington University, um, 
there was a federal elections project that covered uh, that entire election and again does some matching up to the 2000 census. You can uh, do some analysis, really granular analysis down to a small geographic level in conjunction uh, with you know demographic and other kinds of social data that are included in the census. So that's kind of uh, an interesting uh, and helpful one. Uh, the sort of early precursor to this um, by Gary King out of Harvard and, and a bunch of collaborators was um, the road, the record of American democracy that covered um, all elections sort of at and above the, the state legislative elections um, for all the states um, at, you know, that 170,000 precincts nationwide from 1984 to 1990. So this was a, this was a huge undertaking at the time um, and was obviously you can see this was a gap there of 10 or 20 years before people <laughs> really felt up to trying to do this again. Um, <clears throat> but it can be uh, downloaded in a variety of, of formats and, and is freely available online as well. And finally, like I mentioned earlier, open elections, um, they're trying to, for more recent elections, keep up with um, precinct level stuff. And, and the hope for them is to eventually automate this so that uh, as things happen in the future, they can more easily just kind of pull this all directly in and sort of machine read it and machine clean it up. Um, but that's, that's sort of a pie in the sky dream and, and we're a long way off of that because many elections agencies still only report these if you request, uh, you know, like precinct level election data or even any kind of election le level data from some of these places, they'll still only give it to you like in a PDF format uh, or even sometimes a printout. So. <clears throat> Maybe someday we'll be all machine readable. Now, on the statewide level, um, you can. Uh, get, there are a number of sources you can get this from. Several of these are ICPSR data collections. Um, this first one, State Legislative Election Returns, was done by Carl Klarner. He used to be at Notre Dame, and, and I think he's sort of gone sort of independent now, an independent consultant. Um, and uh, this includes state legislative general election, a few primary terms, but mostly just general elections, down to the legislative district level, um, and has uh, a lot of other sort of features in it, coding for candidates and the type of districts and the type of elections and the like. Um, but that's a great collection, probably the best one for state uh, legislative elections. Um, there's an older collection in ICPSR that tried to um, collect statewide offices, um, so you know these things like lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and whatever, um, down to the county level. It only covers a handful of states, um, states obviously that made this more uh, accessible and easily uh, collected, um, but it's a good collection if you're looking at sort of more historic uh, elections down at the, at the state level, which are really hard to find. This collection here is really interesting. This was by Philip Lampe, who worked for the, um, who was a researcher at the American Antiquarian Society, um, covering the early history of the Republic. And uh, he did extensive research over decades and kept all these handwritten notes. This was before, like, you know, well, it wasn't before typewriters, but <laughs> it was before computers when he started all this. And um, in conjunction with Tufts University, they'd gone through and digitized his extensive collections of notes, coded it all, made it into a, a data formats as well. So it's an interactive uh, format that you can go on to. I think I have this one up. I'll show it to you real quick. Um, and so you can come in and you can kind of browse by state, or you can go by type of office. And you see there's all sorts of things in here, both state, and it goes down to the local level as well, you know, so like councils, county, county city councils, you know, sheriffs, often in the county level, uh, city councils, mayors, um, city assemblies, state assemblies. So there's a really rich set of data in here. And you can actually go here to this link, and he, they've made available all of these uh, data sets um, as sort of tab-separated uh, files that you can download by, by state. So that's a pretty uh, cool source for many of the early years where some of that data was fairly spotty. Um, so that was a, a, a life labor, um, now wonderfully converted into digital format. Another source for more recent ones, um, this site, Our Campaigns, uh, tracks state offices, um, uh, statewide offices, so primarily governor and, and secretary of state and, and attorney general, I believe. Um, this one, uh, they're all, the results are all in HTML tables, so it's a lot harder to kind of extract that data. I suppose you might be able to scrape it, write a, some kind of a JSON or Python uh, script to scrape it. But um, the one drawback with this one is that it's all done by volunteers, so it can be uh, fairly quickly up on the web. 
um, after elections happen, but they generally don't source anything. So I'm a little leery of, of using it, but there may be some cases where you run into um, sort of statewide stuff that you want to get across multiple states, and it may just be easier to get here, at least as initial cut of the data. And finally, open elections does have some stuff down at the state legislative level. Now, at the local level, local elections are um, the most prevalent in the United States. Obviously, we have a lot of local election jurisdictions in this country. Um, but they are one of those areas that has generally been understudied in political science, primarily because of the, of the difficulty of getting access to the data. So like, um, you know, you think getting presidential elections down at the county level is hard. You know, try working with municipal elections data. It's just a nightmare. And <clears throat> So this first one um, is a project that's been working out a rise for a couple of years. It's still in process, and they don't actually have any of the data fully up online, although they have an interactive uh, database to show you some of what they've collected. Um, and it covers various years. Some stuff goes back to 1970, but you know it's mostly going to be more recent years, probably the last 20 to 25 years or so, I guess. Um, but I did get some contact with them. It looked like it had gone sort of dead because I hadn't seen any change in that website for more than two years. But I reached out to them earlier this year, and it turns out that they're still working on it. They don't have everything up yet. Um, and it looks like they're eventually going to sell the data. I'm not sure in, in what format or what pricing structure. But they did say that for academic use that um, people are welcome to contact the principal investigators directly and, and that they would uh, be willing to share some of that data. So that's a good source to know about. Um, and then for other local elections data, you're really sort of um, going to have to go state by state, um, hopefully not you know, municipality by municipality, but um, you know, you will in some cases. But there are a couple places that have done a good job. So like California has done a wonderful job. Um, some different institutes in California um, that have created this California elections data archive it goes back to 1995. Um, but has uh, a lot of really uh, useful data at kind of the local level, including local ballot measures, which is um, pretty interesting and, and hard to find. Sometimes you'll even find these from state boards of elections, surprisingly enough. Um, Kentucky being a really good example, this is one that I've uh, found in recent years, that for you know roughly the years kind of 2010 to the present last I looked, um, they had uh, they included local elections in addition to their statewide elections and federal elections, and they had it down to the precinct level in multiple formats. Now, this is sort of like, as far as I can tell, the gold standard for a state board of elections and not one that happens very frequently. Uh, and again, a new nation votes for that older, sort of early republic uh, time does have some of that local elections data. I do want to mention some stuff about voter turnout. So uh, just to illustrate this, you know, in terms of the long sweep of voter turnout in the United States, um, you know, we have a history of being sort of mediocre uh, voters in this country um, in the sense that, you know, for the long term, most of the 20th century into the day, we've really fluctuated around 60% of eligible voters actually show up to the polls. Um, it's a little bit higher in presidential years, much lower in congressional midterm elections, um, and we've never really had more than 80 some odd percentage, you can see by this, this nice diagram. Um, and, you know, I was looking, we have this um, digital archive of stuff in our special collections. This is a, a, a piece of art by Thomas Nast, who was an um, American sort of political satirist. And I really love this one, and it's sort of the lion and the lamb. Uh, the lion growling about his rights, and you can read the little handbill. It says, before the election, let the truth come out if, heaven, if the heavens fall. So people get really exercised about their political rights um, before the election, and then on election day, you can see the lamb when duty calls. His paper says, election day, probabilities, a little rain with cloudy weather. And so he's looking outside thinking, yeah, I'm in my nice smoking jacket. I don't think I'll venture out to actually vote today. Um, I think that's a nice illustration of too often what happens. And obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it would certainly help if we had a national holiday for uh, election day. It might encourage some turnout at the polls. but. Uh, you know, the example of much of the developed world suggests that unless you institute compulsory voting, um, you, most of the developed world is stuck somewhere around 70 to, to 75 percent turnout. Um, so in terms of turnout data, um, the primary one comes from the Census uh, Bureau, and it's their voting and registration supplement. Now this is um, part of the current population survey, which is primarily an economic survey, but every November at least in election years, they have a supplement that they do that covers 
uh, voting, voting and registration. And so they ask uh, their large samples, about 50,000 people, um, they ask these people uh, about, you know, whether they voted, um, and they ask them, um, oh, I have this one on another slide, I think. Um, they ask them, you know, whether they registered, um, whether they voted, if they didn't uh, register or, or vote, you know, what was the primary reason for not doing that. Um, and so you can uh, get a lot of information directly from the census site, but if you want to get sort of data extracts, um, the best way to do it is through IPUMS, um, and they have a whole collection uh, dedicated just to the CPS. And that goes back to the early 1960s. Now, the sample size is 50,000 people, which is a pretty large sample size, and it allows you to analyze uh, breakdowns of reported voting and registration down to the state level. Uh, which usually uh, it's hard to get that much further down than that. You can't go really any more detail than that because the sample size is not big enough. Um, but it, it does provide us the best um, source of sociodemographic uh, characteristics in, in conjunction with voting. Because, you know, voting, uh, voting statistics, voting, you know, electoral terms or whatever, um, registration in nearly all states, there are a, couple, there are a handful of states that do um, collect you know, like race, uh, racial data, um, other types of demographic data about voters, but primarily most states don't. And so we don't really have any good ways of knowing, you know, how young blacks voted in an election or how um, older females may have voted in an election unless we use survey data. And so the CPS has been one of the primary sources for gathering that for a long time because since this is an economic survey, they ask a lot of these other types of demographic uh, questions in conjunction with it. Um, other sources of data, um, just for pure sort of registration and turnout data, Dave Leap um, has uh, some good stuff on registration and, and turnout. These come primarily uh, pro from, directly from the elections agencies at the, uh, at the state level as well. Um, and they go down to, to the county level. Some towns, in the case of New England, um, rather than counties, uh, several states in New England mostly run their elections through mun municipal agencies. Um, one of the challenges with voter turnout is trying to figure out how to measure it, right? So um, often we talk about there are two primary sources for turnouts in, in terms of the denominator, like who counts as eligible to vote. So often these are based on the voting age, which is just kind of an estimate from census figures of who's old enough, 18 or older, to be able to vote in an election, and that serves as your denominator. Um, that's going to come under a lot of criticism um, because it includes a, a lot of people that are not actually eligible to vote, even though they may be old enough and they're going to be counted in the census. So primarily two sources there, which would be uh, immigrants or people that are not actual citizens of the, of the United States. Um, and then uh, more controversially, um, but also very importantly, felons, right? So. Uh, we have a huge felon uh, population, prison population in this country, uh, as you may or may not be aware. And in most cases, most of those people lose their right to vote when you get convicted of a felon. So that's done, governed at the state level. There are a few states, and there's been a push for reform on this more recently, so that a few states have um, pushed to restore voting rights to felons as soon as they have finished their, their serving their time in prison. Um, there was sort of a controversial case with this in Virginia just recently, and Terry McAuliffe uh, and people looking at that as, you know, an attempt to sort of uh, push things in the Democrats' favor, um, because obviously the, uh, or maybe not obvious to everybody, but uh, clearly documented the fact that the felon population is uh, predominantly African American, um, and so they're differentially affected by the loss of voting privileges, right? Um, and since they vote overwhelmingly, like 95% vote for the Democrats, um, that was seen as, as maybe an overtly political move by Governor McAuliffe. Um, but anyway, the, there's a nice source from Michael McDonald, who is a, a professor at the University of Florida, who's been doing research in this for a lot of time, for a long time, a lot of years, and provides some data on his website about how to recalculate census figures to take into account these uh, different populations that wouldn't actually be eligible to vote. And when you do it that way, one of the things you find is that um, turnout is still not wonderful in this country, but it's not quite as abysmal as it would appear at first blush. Um, finally, there are, I'll put these last two up at the same time, um, these are both actual, uh, they were print reference sources, but on the Sage Knowledge platform as an ebook. 
Um, and actually, I, I worked with them when they first transferred this over. A couple of these used to be like separate subscription sort of interactive sites. You could download the data um, from CQ Press, and then when CQ was bought by Sage, and then they converted this all over to the Sage Knowledge platform, these eBooks just turned into PDFs. Well, I threw a fit, and maybe some other people did too. I don't know. But um, they went back in and added in for these primarily statistical publications. There are just lots of wonderful tables of statistics on turnout um, more generally, and then turnout specifically for the African-American electorate. Um, and they've gone back in and added in the tables in both Excel and CSV formats. So if you have access to those as eBooks on the Sage platform, you can actually download um, the tables themselves right directly out of the publication. So I'm going to wrap up here just with um, a final kind of brief mention about uh, measuring elections um, and how elections are administered and performed. So there are a couple of sources for this. Um, this first one is a collection by Charles Stewart, who's a professor at MIT, studies a lot of congressional elections, and more recently has been interested in studying how elections run in the United States. And he has a, a huge uh, a data verse that he's put together that pulls together several of the major sources for measuring these. So the Pew Research Foundation um, has uh, what they call their elections performance index, that they now are measuring a number of things, 17 indicators that look at things like voter registration rate, turnout percentage, how long people waited at the polls, whether provisional ballots were ejected in different states and, and what percentage and, and the like, to kind of up with an index of how well states are actually running their elections, how open they are, um, how well administered. So that's an interesting source. The US Election Assistance uh, Commission is also uh, something that administers um, a number of federal programs, primarily sort of the National Voter Registration Act and the UOCAVA Act, which is Uniformed Overseas absentee, civilian, something or other, voting. Basically, it's the, it's the um, source for making sure that, that US citizens that live overseas primarily are, are active duty military and their spouses, but also uh, other residents who may live abroad have access to absentee voting privileges. And they uh, have done a series of surveys on their work over the last uh, couple of years to try and measure um, how well that works. And so you get a lot of really interesting things, um, primarily uh, in terms of data that people use in research, it's often questions about like how long did you wait at the polls, how easy was it to vote, um, how much information were you able to actually uh, get and understand from elections websites and, and things like that. So the Census Bureau's VRS uh, supplement is, is a good source for some of that as well in terms of whether people registered and whether they voted uh, and what mode they used to vote, like absentee or in person or on or before uh, election day. Um, same with the survey of the performance of American elections. Now, this is a more recent survey, um, but it's meant to go down to the to the state level. So it's a large sample, it's about 10,000 people, um, 200 drawn from each state, so you can have good comparable uh, survey data across states. Um, finally, the Federal Voting Assistance Program, um, again, is meant to help uh, ensure that people overseas have access to uh, to absentee balloting um, and can uh, get the information they need to vote. And they've done a series of very extensive surveys actually asking um, primarily the military um, but other overseas citizens as well about their experience with, with voting outside of the country. Um, and the final two sources are actually from a couple of um, surveys. So uh, the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, um, which is a very large sample, 30 to 50,000 people um, every they do it every year, but it's primarily every every other year with the congressional midterms. Um, they have a, a couple of questions they ask about people's experience of voting on election day um, or what mode they use to vote. Same thing with the National Annenberg Election Survey, which is primarily about sort of political communication um, and political knowledge stuff, um, but they usually do in incorporate a couple of questions about people's voting experiences as well. So um, that's a lot. I know I just like talk like the motorman uh, for uh, the last hour, but I hope that's been useful. And, and like I said, you can go to the election guide that I put up, and I have a lot of other information there as well, including sort of more referencing materials, stuff about campaigns, which is not so easily quantified, uh, party platforms and nominations, um, as well as some interesting stuff on kind of election maps and visualizations. And the last one that I didn't get to mention that is actually a data source um, is sort of data from prediction markets, so primarily betting markets about U.S. elections. 
um, which have turned out to be fairly uh, accurate sources of predicting uh, who the uh, winner, primarily presidential elections, um, but who the winner of the election will be. So I'm going to leave it there. If there are any final questions people have if they want to, that they've stuck around for, then um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This is fantastic. Um...